my name is Daphne. I am an educator with OceanWise, and I'm really excited to be joining you all today. But I'm actually joining you from Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada today. And that means that I'm actually joining you from the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh First Peoples. And I'm really grateful that I get to be joining you all today from their lands and that we can think about how we can better respect the land, water, and sky around us as they have since time immemorial. So no matter where you live, uh, it's great to be aware of whose lands you are on. As you can see in this map that I'm sharing, uh, this is just a section of North America, but all those different colored areas are different traditional territories. So pretty much anywhere you are, you're on someone else's land. But I am with you joining from OceanWise Conservation Association, and we like to focus on three different main challenges that we see the ocean facing. So those are climate change, ocean pollution, and overfishing. And we might talk a little bit about one of those today, maybe even a little bit about two of those. But really, we at OceanWise, we are a non-for-profit organization whose mission is to empower communities and individuals to take action to protect and restore our world's oceans. So really, at the center of it all, all of the actions we can take is all of us. There's so much that we can all do to make a difference for the planet. And what better way to learn more and know how we can better protect the planet and the ocean itself than learning. So today we are going to have the opportunity to dive in with our wonderful guests from e joining us live from the EV Nautilus. We have uh, Taylor Ann and Megan joining us. So please give them a warm welcome. Thanks so much for joining us, ladies. Hi, Daphne. It's Hello. so great to be with you this morning. Uh, welcome to EV Nautilus. Uh, I want to start by adding an ocean acknowledgement to your land acknowledgement. Um, Taylor Ann and I are going to tell you all about this, but we are talking to you from uh, the center of the Central Pacific right now. And we acknowledge that this ocean that we now call the Pacific Ocean um, has been home territory uh, and place of such importance for people across Oceania, indigenous and local communities. So we'd like to acknowledge the Polynesians, uh, Melanesians, Micronesians, um, Papuans, and other Pacifica people who also for generations and generations, thousands of years have used these ocean spaces and built deep and enduring relationships with these places and interconnections. So as we have the privilege to visit these places, we do so with tremendous respect um, and uh, interest in how our different um, bodies of knowledge and collections of knowledge can teach us about the ocean and, and leave us open to learn from the ocean. Um, to follow up on that, um, introduce ourselves. I'm Megan Cook. I'm sailing as the expedition lead for this particular expedition. Um, I grew up in the great state of Idaho, which is uh, a desert in the part of the state that I lived in. Um, I learned a lot about the ocean from storybooks and from great teachers along the way, and then just following that curiosity um, to build a career that took me eventually out into the middle of the ocean. That's awesome. Uh, I'm Taylor Ann, and I'm the science manager on this expedition, and I have been with the Nautilus for about four years now. I started as an intern, um, but yeah, I, I really love it out here, and I uh, also come from a state that is landlocked uh, and not anywhere near the ocean, uh, not a desert, but the Midwest. Um, so I learned a lot about the ocean from aquariums and in books and on documentaries, so it's pretty cool to actually be out here in the middle of the action now. Um, it's a, a dream come true, honestly. <laughs> when well, we're so thrilled it's exciting to see folks from all over the world here so thanks for letting us know um, where you're from uh, I think maybe uh, the folks joining us from Algeria may be the farthest away from where we are right now but let's talk about where we are I want to show you all the EV Nautilus which is where Taylor Ann and I are sitting right now she is a 224 foot long research vessel home to 45 of us right now so kind of like a small floating city um, this ship travels all around the world where we go um, to explore the deep sea. We send big robots, car-sized robots, and we'll talk a lot more about them down to the deep sea. Um, but you can think about them like robots on leashes. They send us live video back from the seafloor, and we can take you there live right now. So 
right behind us is the control room where our team are flying remotely operated vehicles, collecting observations of the seafloor, um, sharing that live. We're broadcasting 24-7. You can join the live stream after this event or maybe in like a separate tab on the side. Uh, but let's look at the seafloor. Uh, the team is really deep, over 3,000 meters deep, almost 3,500 meters deep right now. And this is ROV Hercules. Checking out the seafloor. What are we seeing here? It looks like we're just seeing a bunch of uh, maybe uh, foraminifera, uh, which is a biological organism, or we could just be seeing rock nodules. We are in a really deep area um, at the base of a, a seamount um, where we could be seeing some manganese crust from uh, lava overflow. So we're seeing some pretty cool things right now. That's really cool. So here is the view from ROV Hercules live on the seafloor. You can see the team zooming in. I'm not quite sure what they've spotted. Oh, it, it is. Like might be a coral. It's a coral. So cool. Uh, an unbranched coral here. But let's take a second and, and step back out to like, where in the world are we talking to you from right now? So for orientation, um, this is the coast of North America over here. You can see Baja Peninsula, Japan and Asia and Australia down here and the central and the Pacific, the biggest ocean on the planet, the deepest ocean on the planet. We started our expedition from Oahu. Uh, we both flew there, joined the ship, and then it took us uh, three days to drive the ship out here to Johnston Atoll National Wildlife Refuge, which is also part of the Pacific Remote Islands Marine National Monument, one of the largest marine protected areas um, under the U.S. jurisdiction and, you know, certainly in the top 10 largest protected areas um, on the planet, which is really exciting to be here and to be in a place where, um, you know, there's so much left to know and so much that is already being protected. Um, let's check out the control van. Do you want to talk through kind of like yeah. what this view is? Yeah, so here? the control van is where all of the action happens. So this is where the ROVs are being driven or flown from. Uh, you can see the pilots are in the front row closest to the monitors uh, where they can see multiple different camera views of Hercules and Atalanta so that they can actually know where they are uh, in relation to the, the environment around them. And then in the back row is where all the scientists sit. Um, so that's where I am back there taking notes on everything that we're seeing, um, making sure that we're collecting samples and where they're going and what samples they are, uh, identifying organisms and having a good old science chat. Um, so there's also a lot of other team members that help us out with this. And the navigator is one of the most important uh, who navigates the ship around so that we can actually, you know, make progress on our dive. Um, and then we also have the video engineers that are making sure our audio and video is going out and that we have really good images. Um, it's amazing how many people we have. Uh, and then of course the SCF, uh, which is a science communication fellow who's keeping our conversations going and um, keeping the audience involved with us to go along on these dives as we are physically live doing them. It's great. Absolutely. So we uh, conduct this exploration 24 hours a day, um, seven days a week when we are out here. We break up into teams, um, kind of like, you know, you may uh, work in shifts at your work or you may know an adult that works in shifts. Um, we take turns so that we can keep exploring the seafloor and see as much as possible while we're out here. Uh, but that also means we get to see uh, spectacular things, not just biology, there's definitely cool animals. We see geology, the formations of the seafloor, ancient volcanoes are something we're exploring a lot right now. We learn about the chemistry of the ocean. We learn all about all kinds of things. But we wanted to show you a couple of our, you know, favorite types of things to see. So uh, let's pull up a, I have a deep sea coral field here. Do you want to talk us through um, what everyone is seeing here. Oh man, we're seeing so many different species of corals here. So along this slope, it looks as though the corals are really happy and doing well feeding in this water column. Um, you can see all that marine snow, which is their source of food, um, which could be, you know, dead uh, plankton or, you know, other material from uh, other or organisms that were previously alive. And these uh, corals here are going to use their polyps to feed and, and grab on these things from the water column. So this is an amazing view of some Victagorgia, some Plexurid corals. We got a lot of different coral species here, high density and diversity, meaning that these guys are doing really well in this environment. Okay, so wait, catch us up. 
the deep sea is dark. We are like way beyond where the sunlight comes in. So how are the corals living down here? Yeah, they actually don't use photosynthesis and they don't have zooxanthellae like uh, shore corals do, um, but they do sequester uh, resources from this environment. Um, and their their uh, protein uh, shells or not shells, but uh, their tests um, are made out of protein. And yeah, it's it's amazing how they can survive down here. I think it's so incredible, you know, to think about like corals are polyps, like the animal itself is a little tentacled thing that is very closely related to a jellyfish or a yeah, sea anemone. Yeah. And in the deep sea, you often see these kind of extended polyps because a coral is in place, maybe growing a thousand years, some corals growing yeah. 4,000 years. And these little tentacles just reach out and like anything you can grab is what yeah. you can eat from yeah. there. It's quite fascinating. Um, it's really fun to watch uh, larger corals, like soft corals feed. Um, yeah, we we definitely have been seeing a lot of that. I wanted to show you another um, of my favorite clips of the kinds of things we see. So not just coral gardens, but this is a clip um, that takes us back to the California coastline. And we were flying along kind of a muddy sedimented seafloor when we saw these purple googly eyes start <laughs> looking back at us. We zoomed in and this is a googly eye stubby squid. Its uh, species name is um, Rosia pacifica. And that is not a dog chew toy. It is not a stuffed animal that fell over the sea, over the side of a ship. This is a fierce predator that would fit about in the size of your hands, a little bigger than a grapefruit, a little smaller than a volleyball. Um, and uh, Rosia pacifica uh, is an ambush predator and it has a specially adapted sticky mucus coat um, that it can stick sand grains to itself and then use a chemical reaction to break away from the, that sticky coat and leap out on food when it wants it. But I don't think this particular stubby squid had maybe ever seen a giant robot in its neighborhood. So it just froze in place and gave us this, this face, um, this Stubby Squid even ended up in a commercial, an AT&T commercial with Taylor Swift. So this is quite a favorite and like kind of dazzled the world with its <laughs> silliness. Um, but I, I love that it just shows us like when we go and work in the deep sea, um, we never really know what we might find. And that's some of the excitement. Yeah, honestly, I couldn't believe that was real when I first saw mm -hmm. it. It's it's pretty crazy, the things that we find down here. Absolutely. Um, for history fans, just one more awesome clip. The history, the deep ocean is also the biggest museum on earth, right? It has our stories of humankind as we've traveled across oceans for all kinds of purposes. Um, this was a shipwreck we dove on called the USS Independence, an American aircraft carrier that was intentionally sunk after World War II. But it also leads us into this story of, we used to throw things in the ocean in this way. We kind of disappeared the ship. That was the tendency. We wanted this to go away. So it got sunk in the ocean. Um, but then it became this uh, total oasis of life, giant glass sponges. Those are animals, um, you know, and we know exactly how old they are by getting to visit that place. Um, crabs and fish you can see living in the spaces. So um, this was a fascinating expedition for me. Also, just because, you know, it told us a story about how we use the ocean, how we care for the ocean, but also like how cool. I liked history a lot as a kid too, um, to get to explore a little bit of history and biology kind of mixed together. Yeah, that is really cool to be able to uncover those secrets of history right. like that. So one of the other things that we find sometimes is trash. Do you want to tell us a little bit about the kinds of things that we see yeah. on the seafloor? Yeah, unfortunately, we have seen quite a bit of trash. Um, I think since my first year actually on the Nautilus, I have seen um, pieces of, you know, Coke bottles or uh, fishing line, trash bags. Uh, I've even seen a bath mat, like the rugs that you use out, um, in your shower. Um, so yeah, it's it's. I haven't seen one season without a piece of trash on the seafloor. And we're talking about, you know, potentially 13,000 feet deep, which is really, really deep. Um, so sadly, we're making our mark with plastic um, and other pieces of trash in the deep sea. Uh, this was one from e earlier this expedition. So um, although we were, you know, very far offshore, about 800 miles from Hawaii, right in the center of the Pacific, um, this is a flip-flop uh, that somehow made its way out here to the seafloor and uh, had sunk down among these um, ancient basalt rocks. So you're looking at a volcano that may be 80 to 100 million years old here, and, and this um, flip-flop, which is certainly not 80 to 100 million years old is here in place. Yeah. Um, but Taylor, and this uh, has something that has like fascinated you. Tell us a little bit more about your interests with 
trash and the ocean coming together. Yeah. Um, so I, I would say it happened my first year out as an intern um, with the Nautilus. Uh, I was just really shocked by how many times I saw myself logging that I was seeing debris on the ocean floor as the data logger. Um, I'm not only logging, you know, samples and, you know, biology, but all of these things that we've caused uh, and and have disposed of in the deep sea. Um, so it led me to, you know, question what other things could be in the deep sea uh, affecting uh, marine life and what's going to happen to that plastic over time if it's just sitting down there um, with, you know, all of these ancient creatures. It's, it's really sad. Um, but it's something that I wanted to dedicate my, you know, research to uh, so that I can help you know, make informed decisions uh, and policy maybe one day um, and to help people understand the impacts that uh, our actions have on the deep sea, even some of the most remote places in the world. So with the OceanWise team with Daphne, we've been plotting a little bit. Hidden in the deep is certainly about the biology. It's certainly about the geology. But today we want to talk about microplastics and uh, some of those types of like cutting edge research impacts that we are going to places we've never seen before on Earth. And what are we learning about our impacts there? Um, so Lauren, do you want to talk a little bit about like how did you form a research question? How did you decide how to study this in the deep sea? Yeah, um, so I actually was inspired by another scientist uh, that was doing the same type of research, um, but I knew that um, plastic pollution could be a problem everywhere. So initially my project was going to be in kelp forests um, where I wanted to see if kelp forests could harbor uh, microplastics um, because they are a place that we know are really good for the oceans. They produce a lot of O2, um, but because of the really thick forests, you know, I was thinking potentially that these plastics could be hanging around there for a while. Um, but sadly, due to COVID-19, I had to change my project. Um, and OET was really, really receptive of that. Um, I asked if I could come out and uh, collect samples my second year as a science manager in training. Um, and I wanted to explore, you know, how do microplastics uh, affect the ocean? Uh, are there microplastics from the surface all the way down to the deep? Um, and if so, what types of microplastics are there and, and what concentrations? Um, I really wanted to know how these microplastics would be penetrated in their environment um, as well. So I wanted to collect organisms to see if they were also feeding on these plastics. Um, and if so, you know, which organisms could potentially be, you know, most harmed if it's a, a detritivore or an organism like a sea cucumber that will feed in the sediment, or if it'll be a coral that uses its polyps to feed in the water column. All right, so let's let's pause for a second. Our ocean rights audience um, is very involved in this issue and may know a lot about microplastics already, but let's make sure everybody is there. What is a microplastic? Is this a microplastic? No, but it can become a microplastic. <laughs> okay. Yes, um, so there are two different types of microplastics. There are primary microplastics, which are created on purpose to be very small. So you could think of these things as like packaging nurdles, those little beads and packages, or when you're washing your face, sometimes those little micro beads are in there okay. um, and that can be plastic. Um, so another type of microplastic would be secondary, which is what you're looking at um, earlier um, with the big sea line or line of, uh, yeah, I don't even know what that is. <laughs> I think it's a, it's a, is it fishing? Line? It's a fishing gear wrapped or yeah. a little piece of a shred of a fishing gear. Stack. Yeah. So uh, plastics like that can break down uh, over time. And that is known as a secondary microplastic. So anything from water bottles, anything that you see floating at the surface. So, you know, the, the giant garbage patch that we know is in the ocean. Eventually, if those things aren't taken out of the ocean, they'll break down over time because plastic is not organic. Uh, it will never disappear fully. Um, it will just be very, very, very microscopic, um, which organisms can still feed on. All right. Daphne, I think we have a microfiber guessing game. Um, let's check on everybody's knowledge here. Awesome. And I do see we have a few related questions in the chat. So after our quiz, uh, maybe we can answer one or two of those. But let me let me share real quick and I'll show a picture here of just some examples of those primary and secondary microplastics that Taylor Ann was talking about. So we can see those nurdles and microbeads and then what those larger chunks are going to break down into, which can be those tiny fragments or even at synthetic fibers from our clothing as well. So we do, for those secondaries, get that breakdown of those larger pieces that we might recognize what they were originally into those pieces that we can't really recognize anymore. And that can be a really big challenge for many uh, animals and other life in the ocean. So if you're an animal, you might find two different looking items in the ocean. You might see some of what's at the top and some of what's at the bottom. So my first question is, 
if you're an animal, which one of those is the food you should eat? Let us know, what do you think in the chat? The top one or the bottom one is the food. Well, I see we're pretty, we've got some great knowledge here. Hopefully we learned a little bit from those, uh, those microplastic pictures. Ah, uh, yeah, we're getting that bottom one. So that is gonna be that plankton, those tiny, teeny tiny plants and animals that are living in the ocean. In this case, we see at zoo, zooplankton, those animal plankton. You can see some of them swimming around there. But you know what? It's not always that easy. So I just have a quick clip for us to learn a bit about how these microplastics can impact these animals. Food chain. Microplastics don't just float about harmlessly. They've infiltrated the ocean ecosystem, largely by being accidentally ingested or mistaken for food. It's getting ingested, eaten by organisms like zooplankton, and a fish ingests that zooplankton. And as it makes travel between oceanic zones, other animals that eat it are like, oh great, a delicious fish snack. So they are now predating that fish. And that fish has eaten a zooplankton, and that zooplankton has eaten a plastic, and so that fish is now the inheritor of a microplastic. So as we saw, you know, those microplastics can actually get ingested by those small animals like that plankton, and they can actually make their way up the food chain, even between different levels in the ocean. So even if something's getting eaten in the upper levels of the ocean or the bottom levels, it can kind of travel between and impact other areas of the ocean as well. And we at OceanWise have, are really lucky to have some amazing world-class researchers also diving into uh, some similar topics around microplastics, especially some around microfibers. So those pieces, little tiny pieces that come off your clothing when they're washed, uh, which we might not think of with our laundry. But my question is, are you as good at, as our scientists at figuring out what is microfiber or what is algae? So first item, what do we think? Let us know in the chat, is that algae or is that plastic? What do we think? I'll give us a few more seconds. I see some guesses for algae, some for plastic. In this case, it is plastic. It is probably some nylon from an item such as a rain jacket. That's an item that is classically nylon in a lot of cases. Next one, what do we think? Algae or plastic? Gets tricky, isn't it? <laughs> I see a lot of guesses for algae this time around. You are correct. It is a tiny, tiny, micro, small piece of algae. All right, one more. Let's see. It's getting harder. I think this one's really tricky. Well, I'm getting a big mix here for both guesses. In this case, it is plastic. It's actually some polyester, uh, which you would see in a lot of fleece items and many other, many other clothing items as well. But fleece is a big culprit for those microfibers as well. All right, last one. Let's see what we think. Awesome, mixed reviews again. The final one was actually plastic as well. So it's not just those fibers from clothing as well. Uh, as we talked about, some of those larger pieces of plastic can also break down into those teeny tiny pieces as well. So well done, everyone. You can see just how hard of a job Taylor Ann has and some of our researchers at OceanWise as well. But uh, I, we had a few questions in the chat I wanted to see if we could answer. One of those being, is it beneficial to remove some of that plastic that you do see in the deep sea or is that more uh, harmful to that environment? It's a really good question. Um, ROVs are not a very good tool for being trash picker uppers. Um, and that is because they uh, have really limited pockets. You could think about it that way. There are only a few places to store things that you pick up. Um, there's a, a what we call a bio box on the front and the back. You could think about that like a cooler. And that is where we are going to put um, animal samples and rock samples. Anything that is floaty is kind of like the worst nightmare of the ROV yeah. pilots to pick up because um, every time you're going to open that box, you're going to 
like Let have free. things yeah. free. Um, mm -hmm. And particularly when it comes to things like fishing gear, um, because the ROVs uh, could potentially get entangled on the seafloor and um, the way that the whole system works together here, we can show you that these robots are connected to the ship at all times. So from Nautilus down below, um, this is a technology system we call telepresence, but you could think about the robots, Hercules on the seafloor sending data and video back up. But if that robot got entangled on the seafloor, your entire ship is now anchored to the seafloor, um, which is not a scenario that we want to end up in. So instead, we uh, we work really hard to to not. So occasionally we can pick things up, but most of the time we're we're so limited in what we can carry that um, that is not the the purpose of the particular dive. Yeah, there are oftentimes we see these creatures that are colonial organisms called siphonophores, uh, and we sometimes think that they're fishing line, um, and the pilots get really nervous and have to start avoiding it um, because yeah, it can be potentially really. Uh, harmful for the ROVs. Um, but yeah, it is, it's also really hard because there have been times we've seen things like large tires, but they have so many organisms growing on them already. So if we were to take that substrate away, it would probably harm those organisms that have found a, a home there, even though it's not natural and isn't ideally supposed to be there. The great question. Yeah, those are some great answers as well. And I think that we'll talk a little bit later about some uh, other actions that we can take, even if, you know, those yes. items in the ocean might not be the easiest things to make that impact with. But uh, Taylor, and I think we've got a little bit more that we want to hear about from you because your work sounds amazing. Yeah, of course. Yeah, I can explain a little bit about what I do. So I'm a master's student. Uh, I am getting another degree in biology. Um, so my project is focusing on microplastic pollution specifically in the deep sea. Uh, and within marine protected areas, the Monterey Bay and the Channel Islands National Marine Sanctuaries. Um, so basically, I want to know if uh, the amounts of plastics that we're finding are changing along with different depth gradients. Um, and if so, what types of plastics are we seeing there? So that way we can kind of trace it back, uh, kind of like a mystery to figure out where these plastics could be coming from. Um, so I've collected water samples from depths all the way from the surface to about 3,200 meters wow. um, to, to filter the water to see if we're finding any plastic. Uh, and the way that I collect this is using a Niskin bottle, um, which is really cool. It closes um, and it captures the water all at once uh, in that water column and brings it up to the surface for us. Um, so I filter that water and Honestly, I've seen plastics in almost every water sample. Um, I'm not really seeing as much as like the larger fragments, but I am seeing very small fibers um, from clothing. Uh, and I also wanted to know if this is happening and getting into the, the organisms down there. Um, so I collected some fun little sea pigs um, and some urchins and some coral to see if they'd be feeding on these plastics. So here you can see a sea pig. Um, this is actually in the family of sea cucumbers. It's a holothurian. Um, and it feeds in the sediment. It's a, det a detritivore. Um, so I collected these and I turned them into goop uh, <laughs> using chemicals to break them down. Um, and that's what it looks like afterwards. Um, so I was able to melt them essentially <laughs> um, and filter them to see if there are microplastics in their guts. Um, so I have so far seen that there are uh, polyester fibers um, and some nylon fibers, um, but I'm still working on the statistical analyses to indicate um, if this is a significant result. Um, but the step for that was, you know, filtering, then counting the microplastics under this microscope, which took me hours and hours because I have over like 200 of these filters. Um, so I'll just be looking under that microscope and looking for anything that looks unnatural. So it could be uh, a fiber or something with a weird color um, that's not organic. Um, and it's pretty easy to tell the difference uh, for me as I've been you know, doing this for a, a long time now, a couple of years looking at these samples. Um, and yeah, it's it's pretty incredible the the amounts of plastics that I have seen on these filters. I love that your feet are up. I mean, I think sometimes <laughs> folks think about science happening like really fast, right? Like a TV episode, like CSI. You're like, yeah. no, 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 we're gonna solve the mystery in <laughs> half an hour. Um, but tell us a little bit about how long you've been working on these samples. Yeah, I've collected these samples back in 2020, so it's taken me a while to actually. Um, process all of them. Uh, it, it takes a couple of hours to just get through maybe 10 samples, especially once I get to the next step of trying to confirm if it's real plastic or not. Um, so 
counting the plastics took a long time. Um, but then I started this new process uh, called micro FTIR. Um, make sure of that. Yeah, and we can look at this machine. It's actually a machine they use in crime labs too, um, which it is CSI. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is like CSI. It's a mystery. Um, so I use this machine. Um, it has infrared technology that will shine a really bright infrared light through um, the plastic fibers that I have. And it will tell me what the chemical makeup of this fiber is. Uh, and it'll read back and what is called a spectra, which will give me essentially like a little fingerprint of what uh, material I'm seeing. Uh, and that way I can tell, you know, what, what plastic is this? Um, and the way that this works is because the micro FTR has a known library of plastics stored in it, um, which were plastics made from factories or plastics that were collected from the environment. Um, and then scientists will upload them and their spectra will be analyzed and it'll be saved. And so then what I'm looking at will be compared to that. Um, and I have uh, found some confirmed nylon and some confirmed polyester fibers. Um, and here are some images of the plastics that I've seen in my counting process. Um, and it's, it's, it's bizarre, honestly. I've seen a lot of polyester bundle fibers, like the ones that everyone was thinking was algae a little bit ago. Um, and it can, it can be really confusing, especially for an organism. Um, thankfully, I'm, you know, able to distinguish the difference, but animals in the deep sea or anywhere, honestly, they probably can't even see these or they don't, can't distinguish the difference between something natural and organic. Yeah, so I was incredible. I was going to ask you, Taylor, and uh, for your sample choice for uh, your collected samples, uh, did you have a specific type of animal that you were looking for? Like, were you looking for maybe a filter feeder, like an animal that's not going to be choosing what it's getting? It's just going to grab whatever's there. So maybe a combination of plankton and plastics, or did you have specific feeding types you were looking for? Yeah. Um, so I did look for two specific feeding types. Um, I did choose tr detritivores, so sea urchins and um, sea pigs, uh, which feed in the sediment. So um, along with these samples, I took push core sediments, which collects the sediment from the seafloor and lets us look at the layers to see what's in it. Um, so that way I wanted to see if we're seeing the microplastics inside of the organism itself and also within the sediment on which it feeds. And then I also collected sea pens, which are octocorals that use little polyps to feed in the water column. So these are more active types of feeding that I wanted to look into um, to see if organisms could be actively actually feeding on these plastics instead of uh, maybe passively um, like like a sponge might be. Mm. Very cool. And then one more uh, question. What are some of the effects of microplastics on the environment on and on those deep sea species? Yeah, so bioaccumulation is, you know, one thing that a lot of humans are concerned about. We, there's been research recently that has come out that um, earlier we were talking about the zooplankton that were, you know, eating these plastics and passing it up the food chain. It's actually finding its way into our plates and we don't want to be ingesting plastic for a multi multitude of reasons. Um, but one reason is that plastics can contain harmful materials that aren't good for our bodies. Um, and that's something else that I'm interested in studying in the future. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's pretty bad if you <laughs> ingest a chemical that's not supposed to be in your body. Um, but for organisms, not necessarily for us, it can uh, disrupt their reproductive systems, a lot of their biological processes that, you know, they're just naturally supposed to be able to do. Um, but it could block their their digestive pathways. Um, and it can yeah cause a lot of problems for them. Um, and it, it's been seen from levels of zooplankton up to urchins that I, I've been studying different species of. And yeah, it, it has big potential uh, harm uh, for, for organisms. And we don't want that to be continually passed up to our plates, our dinner plates either. Um, but we do know that we have um, ingested microplastics and there have been plastics found even in human uh, bodies and blood. So I think it's one of those things that is just like so inspiring to action, right? Because like we're going to these places we've never seen them before and there's plastic there, like there's plastic in the sediment, the water and the animals. What a bummer. But like there's so much we can do and we're going to make sure that we leave lots of time to chat with you about how to get involved to fix this. But I, I think it's one of those. Um, OK, you know, like we know this. Let's go fix this. Yeah, kind of to take action. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Definitely. Um, it's a, it's really hard because you can't just pick up all the plastic in the ocean as much as you really, really want to. Yeah. Well, and one thing that I find interesting is kind of seeing what are some of the most common uh, items that we are seeing. So question for you both. Uh, 
is there a type of plastic or garbage item? Maybe uh, I think we covered sort of the types of microplastics you're seeing the most of, but just in larger scale items that we might be more familiar with, are, is there something that's most commonly seen? Yeah. Um, so for me, I've been seeing fibers mostly. And in the research that I've been reading, other people um, publishing papers is that microfibers are probably one of the most numerous, if not the most numerous type of microplastic. Um, and one simple way that we could fight against, you know, this happening over and over again is by paying attention to what kind of clothing that we're buying. Um, so if our clothing is made out of polyester um, or other plastic derivatives, um, when we're washing these things, millions and millions of microplastics are actually washing down the drain and some of them find their way into the ocean. Um, so one way that we could you know, potentially offset this is by trying to buy more sustainable materials. Uh, but if that's something that's you know, too expensive to do, which oftentimes it is out of reach for some people, um, you could go thrifting and buy like recycled clothing. Um, Cause that, yeah, that will really help the environment instead of purchasing all this new plastic clothing um, and washing all these microplastics into the ocean. Um, so that's like a simple action that you could do that would really, really make a difference. Yeah. And when we, you know, to um, take it even bigger, like across the whole scale of the ocean, we see a variety of plastics. Um, we have found there are, you know, kind of any scale from the micro all the way to um, Nautilus and the ROV Hercules have seen um, shipping containers on the seafloor. Um, very big. We have found appliances like um, anywhere from a washer, washing machine was found once. Um, we found a rice cooker that had an octopus living inside that it had climbed inside and like closed the lid and had created its own home inside this rice cooker sitting on the seafloor. Um, lots of plastic bags, um, including sometimes bags of trash. Um, but we also see, uh, you know, different materials break down at different rates. Plastics are going to degrade into smaller and smaller plastics, but things like glass bottles or aluminum cans, um, it's again, kind of like a mystery. You can see sometimes from the branding on them, uh, what era they were produced in, um, which means sometimes you get to see, you know, soda bottles or pop bottles from, you know, the fifties, the sixties, um, all the way, all the way on out. Um, glass yeah. is more inert, you know, we're not as concerned, uh, I'd say, Ideally, we wouldn't see our human impacts on the seafloor at all, but uh, something like glass that we see other times um, maybe there. A very common one I will also just address for you all is fishing gear, but I, I want to make sure that we make the point that like as we look for solutions, this isn't fishers being, you know, bad people or uncaring about the ocean. The work of working in the ocean is, is really challenging and really difficult, um, and nets are specifically designed to uh, work well in water and be sort of a medium buoyancy. So when nets are lost by accidents or by entanglement, um, they can drift around the ocean for decades and decades and decades. So as we open our eyes to this issue, we are seeing a huge issue, but it doesn't mean that everyone is out there like dumping nets off of their ships right now. Um, we're seeing, you know, generations of, of impact as we're just starting to learn about that and bring it to light with the ROV lights. Yeah. Definitely. And that's, that's a great thing to mention too, because I feel like that's a big topic that we hear a lot about with plastic pollution and, you know, litter or, you know, plastic that we find in the ocean as well. But there's so many ways that it can get into the ocean. Uh, I don't know if you want to mention something about that before I continue. Yeah, there are multiple ways. Um, so the main one that I mentioned earlier was like washing our clothing. Um, but yeah, not recycling of, of, process of like plastic uh, items properly. Um, there is just so much plastic waste that, you know, what are we going to do with it eventually? <laughs> um, that's why we need to be recycling these items and reusing them um, down to like, you know, being able to reuse them for years and years and not just recycle them like single use plastic. So um, that's why I think uh, things like the straws and, you know, um, cutlery have become really, really kind of like the star of banning plastics um, because these are things that are just so simple that we could change, um, that we don't have to use every day um, and that we don't have to be throwing out um, and being so wasteful. Um, so I think it's about kind of coming up with solutions of other materials that we could be using um, and not necessarily, you know, blaming it on the person, but just using it uh, uh, as a, a motivation to come together and to create solution uh, of what different types of materials we can use. And I know there are scientists working on um, making different materials out of like algae mm. and uh, yeah, sustainable materials that will break down, but still have that same type of um, hold as plastic. Yeah. 
And <laughs> I guess as non-coastal, you know, um, kids that we both yeah. grew up away, uh, I just want to encourage that um, whether you are picking something up in your local stream or a river or alongside a roadway, um, the ocean is is downhill, downstream of everywhere. So we all can make these impacts, um, whether you are looking at the ocean right now out your window or whether it may be thousands and thousands of miles away from you. Um, you know, as things like get into the ocean, they come from storms, um, especially as we have, you know, big storms, like a big thunderstorm just goes like whoosh and washes everything that isn't contained um, down to a stream, down to a river, out to a lake, eventually to the ocean. So that's that's how these things find their way there. Definitely. And we've got some great actions that we've mentioned already. Uh, if you have mm -hmm. any other action ideas, things that we can do to make a difference for the planet, feel free to share those in the chat with everyone. Uh, but I have a quick question for everyone to kind of spark some of these actions as well. So that is, half of the plastic in the world was created in the last how many years? So we started making plastic or plastic became uh, quite popular around the 1950s, but how much, how, how long did it take for us to have just half? So 50% of the plastic, 50, 25, 15, or 10 years. What do we think? It's a hard one. But you know what? Unfortunately, in the last 15 years, we have had 50% of the plastic on our planet produced Whoa. so it's not a great wow. sign but that does mean that there's a lot of room for improvement right there's 50 percent of our plastic is that's produced is designed for immediate disposal so there's a lot of things that we're using that are getting used maybe once that we maybe don't need to use or maybe we have a, a way around that i know that taylor and you were mentioning maybe buying secondhand clothing or reusing things recycling definitely some great things to have uh, some of the three that I have just to suggest today, this is only three ideas, there are so many, is to tell your friends and family, right? That's something that all of us have access to, no matter where you live or your age. We can always tell people uh, what we love about the ocean and what we can do to help it. But one of the biggest ones I like to talk about is buying less, right? Buying less items. Maybe that means using less of that plastic, using less of that unnecessary plastic and finding those ways. So be creative, talk to friends. What are some things that you can cut out in your life that aren't necessary? There are things we're going to still need to use, but maybe some we don't. And as you were saying, it's, it's really hard and unsafe for you all to be picking up that litter that you see in the deep sea. But one of the best ways to help is to make sure it doesn't actually make it to water at all, right? It could make it to rivers or lakes or the ocean, but picking it up before that happens. And we can all make a big difference when we do things together. So one action that you may have done already is actually doing an ocean-wise shoreline, shoreline cleanup. And that's where you can uh, sign up to do a cleanup on anywhere that there is land and access to water. So that could be a storm drain, right? Any of those drains are gonna lead to water, a eventually and largely the ocean. So there's lots that we can do. And my favorite part of ocean wide shoreline cleanups is that you're actually tracking what you're picking up. That's gonna help us use that data to figure out what are the most common items we're seeing and maybe what can we stop using, right? So in 2021, uh, through ocean wide shoreline cleanups from people all over, uh, these were the top 12 most commonly found items. Some of them might be pretty familiar, some might be less understood, but what this gives us is power to make change. And that's my favorite part. One of the really cool examples of this change is uh, just last week, the government of Canada has started enacting a ban of single use, certain single use plastics uh, within Canada. So they actually chose those based on the data from Oceanwide shoreline cleanups that people just like you have gotten. So there's six of those plastic items. Let's see if you can think. I'll give you 10 seconds to think of what they might be. Some of those top culprits. They are checkout bags, stir sticks, six pack rings, cutlery, straws, 
and a lot of hard to recycle food packaging. So there's so much change that we can all make together. And that is small, maybe picking up a few items in your area or telling someone what they can do to even helping with this citizen science data to make long-term impacts. But there are so many different ways that we can make these actions. Uh, and I encourage you to share even more in the chat. But I would like to say there are so many more resources on both of the at nautiluslive.com as well as ocean.org for you to explore learning and further actions as well. But we'd love to answer a few more questions that you all have. So I see some great uh, suggestions. I even see right to your local politicians. Uh, there's some, some great ideas in here. Amazing, I love seeing all those. So I know that one of the big questions we had for you all was talking about those cool robots. Now, you're using them all the time. What happens if they break? What happens if that goes wrong? Such a good question and such an important question, right? We are out in the middle of the ocean, which means you can't just like stop by like ROVs are us and pick <laughs> up some extra parts um, to repair anything that might go wrong. Um, so we uh, come prepared and that means having a room on the ship. We call it the hangar, kind of like an airplane hangar, um, but it comes pre-packed with, well, pre-packed. We stock it with all kinds of spare equipment, um, supplies, anything we might need to fix it. Um, the ROVs are really fantastically complex machines. Here is a launch sequence that will just let you see ROV Hercules and all the different types of components that come together here. Hydraulic arms, lights, cameras, bio boxes, sensors that tell us things like the uh, salinity and temperature of the ocean. And so we have a lot of spares. And but one of the other things that I love is the way our team comes together when something breaks, right? Because um, it's a very small team out here. We're a little floating city. There are a lot of different professionals. So that means, you know, nobody's job is just to like hang out and watch what's going on. Everyone needs to be part of the action. And so when something breaks or goes wrong, you know the phrase like put your heads together. You literally see that the ROV team and others will get together in a circle and say kind of like, okay, what do we know? What do we have? Um, what can we do right now? And how can we get to a solution? So it's really creative. It's really based on a lot of teamwork, um, but certainly things break all the time. Um, ROVs are really complex machines. Um, they are made up of thousands of components. And I don't know, I think about this like with math a little bit, right? If every piece worked 99.99 percent .99 of the time but you put 10,000 parts together um, something will break every single time that's just how that math works out so we do these uh, very detailed pre-dive checklists and post-dive checklists so we can figure out what things might not have been working the way that we hoped they would and then um, get them fixed before we dive into the water the next time good question it's super cool to, to think of how many people even would be involved with uh, making all of that run smoothly. So follow-up question to that, what, what skills could youth work on to prepare for an amazing career uh, like both of you have? Yeah, I honestly didn't even know a career like this existed until I was in college. So if you're finding out about this later in life, that's totally okay as well. Um, so I'd say the best way is to just be yourself, ask questions, and be explorative. I think the reason why I ended up here is because exploration was always my passion as a kid. Um, so I would just ask teachers and professors questions about the environment of the deep sea. Um, and I didn't even know that this internship existed. Um, but thankfully, that uh, those questions that I asked led me here. Um, I was a little bit afraid to ask them. I had a professor that was uh, one of the first pilots of the Alvin submarine, and she was really cool. And I asked her so many questions about the deep sea. And, you know, she just uh, told me I should go see it for myself, apply for an internship. So that's what I did. Um, I think OET has a great internship program um, that I would recommend um, for college students. But if you're younger than that, 
just do a lot of research online. <laughs> um, I think that you can also reach out to these local people, like watch our, our, our dives and ask us questions. Um, yeah, and like start learning at a young age with how to tinker with things if you wanna be a ROV pilot. Um, I know we were talking about different types of toys that people can purchase for their young uh, children to, to put together like Legos or different sets um, to like, you know, play around with tinkering with things. But if you're like me, like a biologist, yeah, I think just always be inquisitive. Um, think about the questions of, of, of the world around you, what you want to ask, what you might want to research or what you might want to have the answers to and who you would need to collaborate with in order to find those answers. Yeah, I think that things people have in common here is that we never stop learning, right? Like nobody here, it would be impossible. No one can know what the next thing we're going to find is, right? Um, no matter how many degrees you have, no matter like what kind of school you've gone to. So I think we're all like eager to learn from each other. And that's something too. I think um, you can cultivate that in a lot of ways. Um, you can have many passions in life. I also want to tell you that like the ocean can be one of them, but it can be anything else. It could be ocean and biology. It could be ocean and community work. And how do you bring the ocean back to your community? It could be ocean and cooking right? Ships need chefs. They need maritime professionals. Um, there are engineers who work here. There are filmmakers who work here. Um, professional science communicators, storytellers, scientists of all kinds of disciplines. Um, just so many people, you know, and even science is like, do you want to study the earth, the rocks? Do you want to study the chemistry? Do you want to study the life from the whales to the whelks? Like there are lots of lanes. And so I think just um, feel encouraged that anytime you're finding out what you like. And sometimes that'll mean having experiences where you're like, hey, I don't actually like this. This isn't fun for me. This doesn't match my personality. Well, at least you cross that off the list, right? And you'll be you'll be farther towards finding out what those like multiple passions that you wanna glue together into a career. Yeah, I think the one thing that we've learned here is that there is not one traditional pathway to get here. There have been so many stories that I've learned just this year alone of how ROV pilots became pilots, starting off as a biology or a biologist, and then going now into engineering and driving our ROVs. Like it's amazing. Um, and I also have a passion for art. Um, I didn't know I wanted to do science at first. So uh, you can explore all of those things. I think at the same time, and I think that's what's important and will give you, you know. Um, that that advantage in the in the career field of you know being yourself and having those unique things to bring to the field um, to help yeah bring the the ocean forward and keep it healthy. Totally, I I love that and I I love that both you were talking about you know the ocean doesn't have to be your only passion. That's one of the things that I always am telling at youth. You know, bring whatever it is you already love uh, with it. There's so many different opportunities out there. Uh, I have one last question. I think we have time for. And I love it because it lets me, lets all of us talk a little bit more about actions as well. So we had a question about if there are washing machines on the ship. And if so, do you have filters to catch microfibers or do you ever use, or have you heard of things such as guppy, the guppy friend washing bags? I know that that is something that I personally like to use. And that uh, is a great way if you don't own your washing machine and can't install a filter yourself, uh, you can have a, a fine mesh bag to wash some of those items and to help trap some of those. But see what you have on the ship or any suggestions. What friend? I've never heard of Guppy Friend. Uh -huh. Yeah, there. Yeah, I've I've heard of other brands of different bags like that too. But it's a, a mesh bag that um, will actually catch microplastics. Um, so it prevents a lot of them from being washed down into the drain. So it's it's it, uh, pretty affordable too, I believe. It's like, yeah, only a couple bucks, I think. Um, and that makes a huge difference if you're, you're washing all of these like plastic items, which because sometimes, you know, you can't just entirely make that whole wardrobe change. And even if you did, you know, that's, is that sustainable? You want to keep, you know, reusing these, these items that you already have. Yeah, it's a really good question. Speaking of continuing to learn, I don't know. So I'm yeah. going to have to go ask the bosun um, <laughs> if there is a micro, I feel like that maybe should have been something I looked up before we joined you, but you know, in, but I'll take that as my my That's one of task. many new things to learn for the day uh, and go find out. But we yeah. do have washing machines. We live here. This expedition is three and a half weeks. So um, got to have some laundry. There's a gym, um, amazing chefs that cook food for you. Cookie hours at three o'clock every day on the ship. Like it's a really comfortable, fun place to do this kind of work from. I love it. Uh, and you know what? We're always all learning, right? There's always so much more that we can do. And all we need to do is not get too overwhelmed with actions, just 
choose the ones that we can do and maybe push ourselves for something new every once in a while, right? Sometimes I like to have a new challenge of the month. So uh, we're always learning and we're always uh, adding more actions to our lives. What I would like to say is just a quick reminder of some of those actions that we talked about today, things like, uh, you know, reusing clothing, buying secondhand clothing even, because like we said, you don't have to replace all of those synthetic clothing items you already have. There are solutions to make it less impactful and maybe on your next item that you're going to replace those with, when they get worn out, you can choose some of those more uh, natural fibers. But really, if we can tell people what we know and love about the ocean, I love exploring and sharing all of my nerdy facts. I hope you do too. But also, you know, doing something like a shoreline cleanup, uh, as well as just trying to buy less, right? If you're buying less things, we're needing to ship less across the ocean. And that's a, one of my favorites because it's a double whammy for minimizing pollution, as well as minimizing your uh, carbon footprint, uh, fighting climate change as well. So there's so many easy ways we can make a difference. And if you're looking for some ideas to reduce your uh, waste, you can check out our plastic challenge on the ocean on ocean.org. And that uh, link has been just posted in the chat. But I'd like to say, uh, ladies, if you have any last things you'd like to share, please go ahead. I would just share that um, we would love for you to come on this expedition. I think one of the other things that continues to st sustain me about loving the ocean is finding that, that like joy and wonder. And um, it doesn't get much better than this in the Central Pacific. This was a view last night of a deep sea coral garden, um, massive sponges, like a sponge bigger than your washing machine on the seafloor. Um, this was my favorite Coral, spiral coral, yeah, yeah coral. spiral coral. It looks like a firework. So if you're celebrating, you know, Canada Day or Fourth of July, we have the fireworks here on the seafloor for you. And for Daphne, um, a sea cucumber from the deep sea. So continuing to see these things um, keeps me inspired to want to make change and and create a thriving ocean for the future. So I hope you'll come explore with us at NautilusLive.org or on social media. That would be my last message. How about you, Taylor? Yeah, please join us. Um, please write into us in the, in the chat too. We have live chat when we're uh, diving. We're diving 24 seven out here um, so that we can see what is in this environment. We're trying to characterize it so that we know what's here and what needs to be protected. Um, so yeah, I would uh, challenge you to to join us and also join that plastic challenge. I think I, I can't wait to do that. That actually sounds really cool. Um, and the app that you guys have, uh, the the yeah, the, to track how many plastics that you're finding. That's really great. For sure. um, so yeah, I think there are many ways to get involved. Um, and one way is to, like Megan said, to just stay inspired um, by, you know, being explorative and, you know, having conversations with other scientists or other creators um, and just, yeah, coming up with ideas. I think that that is what we need the most um, as we face all of these challenges with the climate and with pollution. Well, I'd like to say on behalf of everyone, thank you so much for joining us, Megan and Taylor Ann. Uh, this has been amazing. And uh, I know that I have thoroughly enjoyed exploring the the hidden, uh, you know, the hidden deep sea, really, and what's hiding down there. But thank you all so much for joining us. And please, we encourage you to go check out the uh, live exploration on the Nautilus Live website. And uh, you can ask more of your questions to the ladies there as well. So thank you all and have a great rest of your day. Take care. Bye. See you soon.